So thank you. I will actually get into some of the details of what Neil was talking about when we start uh, you know, to try and innovate even beyond what our balance sheet can do. And initially, I was not going to, you know, to use any slides, but when we start talking about blended finance, as Ethan was telling me, it means anything to anyone that you know, basically would like to define it. So I think that for us it's quite important to try and understand what, in particular, as IFC and many other DFIs that focus on the private sector, or what is that we mean uh, by blended finance? So I think the key issue for us has been is how do we get into more things that we want to do, our strategic drivers, and how we can extend our balance sheet beyond what we can do with our own resources. So for us, it uh, you know, as, as IFC, it has meant combining our own balance sheet investments together with concessional finance. And when we talk about concessional finance, we mean that we are taking risks that we are not pricing for. And I think that is when it becomes different, for example, with a number of impact investors that may have more patience, that may use different instruments, but they are pricing for risk or they are expecting to be compensated for the risk that we are taking. In blended concessional finance, we are explicitly saying there will be a portion of the financing package that will not be charging for the risk that is taking. Usually that, uh, that funding comes from trust funds, from either bilateral donors, multilateral facilities, and more recently, one of the innovations, and I, um, you know, Mark mentioned, I the 18 and how we have gone to the capital markets to go and get some aspects. Another innovation from IDA 18 was to give 2.5 billion for IFC and IDA to complement our activities in the lowest income and fragile countries with this financial innovation and the concessional finance. And this package that we put together is what we call blended finance. When we talk about blended finance, also we are talking about a multitude of instruments that we can use. And for us, it can be, you know, senior loans that are pre priced at a lower interest rate. That is one possibility. A senior loan that has a longer tenor than what IFC would give, but again, may not price fully for that longer tenor that we are providing. One of the instruments that has probably the most promise is anything that is mezzanine lending, because that al allows us to tailor the concessionality to what is that the project needs. So, you know, when you have a mezzanine loan, you can actually attract the, pr the private sector as lenders to the project and tell them, I'm going to cushion if there is a, you, uh, to cushion you if there is a risk that you were not expecting in these countries. At the same time, you can maintain alignment with the equity because you're above the equity. So the, the sponsor, the project developer can still, you know, be there and, and do what they need to do in terms of developing the project. Um, we, uh, yesterday, we heard a little bit about this uh, resharing facilities and first laws, you know, guarantees. And we have seen that actually that's very, very important to be able to get the local domestic institutions to stay there to expand the reach, and at the same time to be able to, to do more. So we have a program that we have put together um, with either resources um, that uh, we call it the Small Loan Guarantee Program. So what it does, it's basically allowed a domestic institution in all of these fragile you know, countries that are interested in lending um, to be given a 50% uh, you know, cushion from IFC. So IFC says, go ahead, expand your portfolio across SMEs. It is for, in particular for SMEs and SMEs that could be in the agri space, in climate change, uh, that SMEs that are, you know, women on. So in all of these areas, we're saying, go ahead, expand your portfolios. But because you believe that it is risky, and it is our view that probably is less risky than you believe, you know, we are going to give you a guarantee for 50% of it. So if there are losses, you know, we'll share the losses half and half. In turn, IFC goes, you know, to IDA and we get a cushion. For, uh, you know, from either to our own balance sheet to be able to do this expansion. So it just thinking of it is 120 million that IDA is providing um, to create that cushion. With that, we believe that we will be able to do 400 million of IFC investments in these countries. And that, again, as I mentioned, that it is 50% share with the domestic uh, banks. 
they will put this other 50%. So with 120 million of support, you are getting 800 million of potential lending into these countries. One most, more important aspect is I talk about this 120 million of support. This is not grants. This is basically a, a guarantee that is sitting there that will only be exercised if there are losses. So we don't expect that all of that capital will be lost. In addition, we are able to at least charge a concessional you know, fee, a concessional guarantee fee for it. So there is at least some compensation going back to IDA for putting that uh, funding at risk. So I think that is one of the guarantees and innovation. And then the other thing that we are seeing, and I believe Chris will probably get into a little bit more of that into the equity, but we also see that either doing direct equity with companies, and Neil mentioned the importance of supporting some of these firms. So doing direct equity, in some cases what we have seen is that it is the, the concessionality is harder to measure because it may mean that at the beginning we just say we are going to close the financing gap. No one wants to give equity, so we know that there is an issue, and IFC and other DFIs may say, okay, I'll put some equity, but I'm not going beyond five million, and then we could come with the concessional funding with another five million. If we don't see the obvious need to put price concessionality there, we may come on exactly the same terms, and that's why it's much harder to say, you know, this is how the concessionality is measured. The other form that we tend to see, you know, equity in which we do is we just become more patient and we say, okay, IFC and other investors may get your returns first, and then we will get the returns later. So that's another way that we are doing. And then, you know, the time value of money, there is an embedded concessionality that is a little bit more obvious. So that's what we are doing in equity. And the other thing is that we have also been investing in, in private equity funds um, through concessional, you know, forms. There, what we are trying to do with the concessionality is the in increase um, the impact that we are achieving. Uh, so, for example, you know, we have a fund, and this is not in one of the low-income countries. It was an earlier fund that we put. It's in South Africa that was expecting to do affordable housing. So IFC was coming in, was one of the limited partners just to, you know, work on affordable housing. With some of the concessional funds that we have for climate, what we were able to do is to incentivize the fund manager to go into green affordable housing. So you add the additional level of impact that you want to add with some of these structures. So I think, again, f this is a little bit of financial engineering that we use on blended concessional finance, but it allows us to achieve additional impact and to enhance our ability to do more in these more difficult countries. Um, I think what I, it's I think important for us is that you know these funds align to what IFC wants to do. What are our strategic areas? So you see that the funds that we have available are now through the IDA private sector window. Most of the funds that we have available, which is about four billion now, when we started to blend in the early 2000s, it was 60 million under management. Now we have about four billion. Two billion of that is the IDA 18 private sector window. The uh, uh, Quite a, a lot of the of the rest are climate, some for SME finance, and then some for gender finance. So that's what uh, we have. Um, what it's important for us is that you know three strategic priorities IFC of IFC are supported by these new instruments. One is the investments in low income either and fragile situations. The other one is climate change investments, and then gender finance. The other things again are job, you know, creating more jobs, working with SMEs. But these are the three main ones that are supported by our blended finance activities. Um, usually donor partners and other partners, including, you know, Ida, are looking for this idea of leverage. Uh, you know, when you are working on public finance or where we, you work through the DFIs that are working on sovereign uh, lending activities, you tend to see that, you know, for every dollar that a trust fund will have, maybe there is another dollar of the, of the DFI, and that is your leverage going, you know, one to two. When we look at blended finance broadly, and it, this includes, you know, beyond only the low-income countries and fragile uh, situations, we usually tend to see one dollar of donor finance to about three 
of IFC on account financing, and that adds another five of the total project cost. That means sponsor money as well as other co-lenders. Um, so you know, you see that actually this one to eight, one to nine is quite significant. When we get into the low income either and fragile situations, that tends to be instead of 1.8 or 9, about 1.6. Um, and the you know, donor fund to the FI tends to be closer to one to one. And again, it's because they need to cushion much more uh, the risk. Um, this just gives you a very, you know, quick uh, view of what we have done, you know, since FY10 as, as IFC on blended finance. The trends that we are seeing um, are now, you know, instead of just senior loans, we are tending to see much more the subordinated loans, mezzanine structures, and equity. So I expect that our portfolio will move into that direction on blended concessional finance. The other thing that we see because of the availability of the IDA funds is that we are going much more to low-income IDA and fragile countries. One of the, I would say, main criticisms that blended finance has had, and this is the broad definition of blended finance, which is development finance together with commercially minded finance, which is the definition that the OECD uses. Um, when you put that, one of the main criticisms is it has only been for middle income countries. And the reality is that a lot of it has been on middle income countries because the way that we started to blend in the early 2000s was with climate funds. And there we wanted to do climate mitigation, and that was middle income countries. So, I mean, there is a reason for it, but we are seeing already in our portfolio a trend to go towards the more low-income countries. And with that means that we need to provide more concessionality. So usually when I am asked what's the difference between you know, the blending that you do in middle-income countries and the blending that you have to do in the more fragile context, is you tend to see multiple layers of concessionality because a discounting interest rate may not be enough. So you tend to see that you have these other de-risking structures, the subordinated loan, the equity, um, and also as as I, I believe, uh, you know, Neil mentioned, then we also understand that blended finance is not the solution for everything. You need to have the rest of the of the equations, and what uh, you know, what you need there is one um, the policy work, the naval environment, and then the other thing, at the firm level, you also need the capacity building for the sponsor. So those are two quite important things. I already went through the different, you know, uh, I will say elements that we will use to provide concessionality, but I want to mention here that one of the other innovations that we were able to do uh, through the IDA private sector window is to move into local currency financing in a, in, in a broader, you know, way. We have one of the facilities of the IDA private sector window is a local currency facility, and I think this is one of the issues that we see in development finance that but it still needs quite a lot of work because we are not there yet. We have solutions that are patchy. We can, you know, use uh, concessional finance there, but we still need to do quite a bit of work there. So. Um, I, I will finish indicating um, that probably, and, and I think we heard Nicola discussing this, and you know when Neil was talking about big firms, when you talk about providing concessional finance, and we need to be explicit, if you are not charging for the risk you are taking, you are providing a subsidy. So when you think about providing this type of implicit subsidies to either large firms, or more generally to the private sectors, or to the banks in Ethiopia, People look at you and say, are you crazy? They are already getting the returns that they should be getting. Equity is taking risk, and we say, yes, it's taking risk, but usually in the expectation of return. Here, you are not expecting returns that are commensurate with the risk that you are taking. So one thing that we have done with other 20 DFIs since 2017 is, one, define what blended concessional finance is so that we can measure. And since 2017, we have issued joint reports showing our annual level of activity in blended concessional finance. And then the other thing that we did is create some enhanced principles of if we are going to use concessional finance for private sector operations, how do we do it in a way that it makes sense? And then we get into, you know, is there a case for it? What is the market failure? 
You know, it's a capital market constraint that we are trying to manage. You know, is there a minimum level of concessionality and how do we get to that so that we are not over-subsidizing? How do we make sure that we do it for a short period of time? The success of blended finance is that commercial money comes in at some point and we are no longer needed. And how do we do it in a way that we are reinforcing markets, um, you know, uh, looking at the policy work that, I, that that World Bank is doing, looking at the technical assistance and capacity building that we ourselves as IFC or others are doing and putting a lot together. And the final thing is we make sure that, you know, we are disclosing this information. And as IFC, we are taking, we are taking this one step further and we have um, committed that for any projects that are mandated that started last October, we will also start disclosing the level of subsidy that we are providing. We have provided this to our board since 2013, but now we are going to make it public because of the same concerns that people believe that we are over-subsidizing. When you look at it, actually, the level of subsidy that we provide is probably in the single digits, about 3-4% of the total project cost. So it's not a lot, but it can be quite powerful if these are pioneering projects. So I'll stop there.